You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. This episode is brought to you by Hyperice, the leader in advanced warm-up and recovery technology. They have tons of innovative products, like Venom heated wearables to help soothe sore back muscles, Normatec compression boots to speed up recovery and increase circulation, and Hypervolt massage guns to improve mobility. Loved by athletes like Naomi Osaka and Erling Holland. Try them yourself. Get 10% off your order with the code MOVE at hyperrice.com. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident panelist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore that Well, training camp day four is in the books, and that's what I want to talk about today, kind of recapping that a little bit and look through the news and notes. But first, as has been done in the past, I want to kind of look around at what's going on around the NFL. Um, NFC North wasn't a ton, but around the NFL, couple themes have sort of emerged. Number one, the uh, crop of rookie quarterbacks last year and this year suck. The news about Justin Fields is not horrible, but it's certainly not great. Mac Jones was 14 of 25 in a pick. Got a note about Zach Wilson says, DJ Reed picks off Zach Wilson in the end zone in red zone drills. Bad throw and Reed might have been able to return it all the way. And then Trey Lance, uh, he's been struggling all through camp, which again, I just don't understand, not just the fact that everybody else is jacked up about Trey Lance, but the 49ers, they're so excited to get Garoppolo out of there and move on, and man, we got our guy. I, it's just weird. I mean, I, I get that, you know, you made the investment, you got to live with it, I guess, but I, it's so weird, but he's been struggling every single day in camp. And just for clarity, this is probably... Well, according to this note, this might be one of his best days. It says, another up and day down for quarterback Trey Lance. More ups today. In other words, again, at least it's better than yesterday and the day before that. But it says, Lance threw an interception right to Fred Warner over the middle, but also hit some impressive uh, throws to Ayuk, etc., etc. So again, up and down. However, a couple other notes on Lance for the day. On that particular interception, it says, another questionable Trey Lance interception. In one of the first clean pockets of the day, Lance just doesn't see Fred Warner right over the middle. Bullet right to him. Clean pocket. No pressure. Throws a rocket right in the chest of his linebacker. He finished 8 of 15 with an interception. That sucks. But it's not just last year's crop. Pickett is garbage. He's been struggling. He's still struggling. And then a note on Malik Willis, it says Malik Willis overly hesitant and back on in back on multiple snaps, whatever that means, in seven on seven, where he should easily be able to find the open receiver. So there's guys open and he's just he's he's not pulling the trick. If you drafted a quarterback the last two years, you're kind of getting screwed. I I've not heard very good things about Ritter. There is a quarterback crisis going on right now. Even even Baker out in Carolina just like threw a I think he threw a pick to a defensive lineman. Granted, it was one of those things where he dropped late. But still, that's always ugly when you're throwing picks to 304-pound defensive linemen. So I don't know which quarterback of the last two years is going to step up and actually be able to do something. It seemed like Mac Jones, but again, he went 14-25 to for the day. I have not heard anything about Trevor Lawrence yet. In fact, let me look because I'm, I'm just curious if anybody's doing anything. According to Pete Prisco, Trevor Lawrence was outstanding in uh, practice today. I don't know exactly what that means, but I'll take that. So Trevor Lawrence, if you're betting on any quarterbacks from last year and this year, maybe that's the guy, which would make sense. Wide receivers, on the other hand, have absolutely been carving it up, like every single one from this year and last year and the year before. It's just it's just becoming a thing where if you're a wide receiver drafted early, or at all, I guess, you're just going to come into the league and dominate. And so I mentioned on Twitter, I'm kind of sad that Christian Watson isn't out there because I really wish we could get in on this party. And I don't know that it would be great. Maybe it would be a disaster, but it's just, it's every single one. I've seen tons of reports about Ronda, uh, yeah, Wandale Robinson, not Rondale Robinson. Wandale Robinson has been having an incredible camp. Chris Olave, George Pickens. I've seen highlight after highlight after highlight of George Pickens. Sky Moore in Kansas City. That Pat Mahomes to Sky Moore connection is just on point. 
Garrett Wilson, I've seen making some pretty circus catches. Even Traylon Burks, who was getting dragged for having asthma, not being able to breathe and whatnot. He's been getting some great reports. Drake London, multiple touchdowns over in Atlanta. I mean, literally all of them. Now, we don't necessarily need to despair because Romeo Dobbs is more than adequate as far as... I wouldn't be surprised if he's having more um, good days than any of these guys. But still, it'd be really cool if Christian Watson was uh, able to get in on the mix. The only other note, and it doesn't really matter, he's an AFC quarterback that isn't relevant to anything, but I can't help but feel like Tua and the Miami Dolphins are really going to do something. I've kind of talked about it before, but ever since I saw the two is like the most accurate deep ball thrower, and he's got Jalen Waddell and uh, Tyreek Hill, and now all the highlights are him. Like Everybody was laughing because it's like Tua doesn't have an arm, and now he's like overthrowing Tyreek Hill on 70-yard passes. It's like, okay, <laughs> we might all be a little bit screwed here. I mean, he's hitting Tyreek in stride over and over and over, and then I did see the note that he actually overthrew him on one pass. And then you got the Miami defense, which is pretty on point. So um, I'm wondering about Miami a little bit. As for the NFC North, the Vikings camp wasn't a ton that I saw that was going on. I saw um, Zadarius leading a skull chant, which made me sick. Um, Kirk Cousins continues to carve up people in training camp because he's a good quarterback, despite nobody wanting to acknowledge it. Probably because he's black. You know how that goes. But otherwise, nothing super interesting going on there. The Lions, Aiden Hutchinson is as advertised. Um, He apparently just lives in the backfield. They moved Penny Sewell over to the other side, I think temporarily just because of injury or rest or whatever, and he just made the guy look silly. Note here says, number two overall pick, Aiden Hutchinson was a problem for the offense during Saturday's practice in Allen Park. He lived in the backfield all day. There was a particularly good sequence of two plays that showed Hutchinson's versatility during a team period. He was inside and beat Jonah Jackson for what would have been a sack. The next play, he got past Penny Sewell, who was playing left tackle to make another play in the backfield. He set Sewell up, thinking he was going inside, and made a terrific move inside to get by him. Hutchinson was uh, has been everything the Lions were hoping he'd be early on in camp. It'll be fun to watch his progress when the pads come on Monday. So that sucks. I mean, yeah, it's just, it's still training camp and all that stuff, whatever, but it's it's always nice to get bad reports, you know? Yeah, it's training camp, but I don't mind hearing uh, Justin Fields through back-to-back interceptions to his rookies. You know, stuff like that doesn't bother me a ton. Hearing Aiden Hutchinson, probably the best pass rusher in the draft that fell to the Detroit Lions, who shouldn't have fallen, but did fall to the Detroit Lions, is um, shredding everybody. Kind of sucks. And then the Bears, again, not much going on. Justin Fields seemed to have a pretty decent day. I didn't throw any picks that I'm aware of. Tevin Jenkins still not showing up due to his injury, I guess. And so the offensive line is still completely in flux. But um, again, nothing super crazy going on with any of these camps. I haven't seen any big injuries or revelations. Valus Jones is everybody super excited about him, which as uh, Sam Holman pointed out on Twitter, maybe that's more of an indictment on your secondary, which is supposed to be the strength of your team if they can't stop a 95-year-old Valus Jones. But we'll let them figure it out in time. But anyways, uh, speaking of pads and whatnot, Monday. Monday is a big day for pads going on, so we get a little bit of a, a better feel for things. So I'm, I'm very excited about that. If, if for no other reason, then we don't have to hear people complaining about, oh, yeah, cool, with shorts and T-shirt on. Whatever, dude. But anyways, why don't we rip through some of the notes? Uh, again, I just kind of took note of some of the tweets through the day, and I'm going to go in order as they happened as opposed to going player by player because it's just more fun that way. Uh, Starting off, David Bakhtiari was out on the field, which it almost just annoys me seeing it and hearing people talk about it, just because literally one year ago was the exact same thing, the exact same videos, the exact same everything of David Bakhtiari. Look at him. He's running around on the field. Looks great. It's like, dude, I'm not going to say I don't care, but I don't care. In addition, Kylan Hill out on the field doing his work. He needs to get on the field quickly because he is rapidly losing his job. Uh, Zach Tom was back with the ones at left tackle. So, I mean, he's, he's kind of, they're taking a real good look. You know, we could talk about, well, they're just rotating and they're changing. They're not really rotating. It's just, uh, changing back and forth between Yash and Zach Tom. So starting offensive line was Zach Tom, John Runyon, Josh Myers at center, Newman at right guard, and then Yash moved over to right tackle. That does seem to be the way that they do it. When Tom takes first team left tackle reps. 
And really, they're just trying to find the best combination of the best tackles. And so I think the biggest question is, is it Yash at left tackle and Newman at right tackle? Or is it Tom at left tackle and Yash at right tackle? It could be a different combination, but right now, that's, those are the, that's the question. Those are the options. Um, Romeo Dobbs, apparently, via Andy Herman, says, what can't he do? Dobbs just did some lead blocking for Aaron Jones out of the, uh, basically an H-back look. I have no idea why they would do that, but it's interesting, and it's kind of cool, I guess. And yeah, it's just more exposure for a guy that's doing literally everything right now. I will say the one thing that was kind of upsetting today is I didn't really get an answer on the starting offensive formation. Was it Lazard and Sammy Watkins? Was it Dobbs and Lazard? What what was it? I don't know. I was trying to get a feel for how that was all set up and, and didn't really see anybody tweet about that. Uh, great rep by Jerron Reed. Meanwhile, he handled Zach Tom and made a stop in the backfield. Kenny Clark lined up outside. Always a good sight. More one-on-one opportunities for him. So the rumors about Kenny Clark trimming up and getting some different opportunities to move outside a little bit. We've now heard about a defensive front that has four defensive tackles. And now we've got Kenny Clark lining up on the outside. I don't know if this is another four defensive tackle look. It's probably like three defensive tackles and then like Rashawn off the edge or something like that. But um, either way, they're clearly trying to be much more creative, which is one of the fun things about having a really talented defense is that you can do more things because you just trust the other guys. We can be creative with the guys up front because I trust my corners and my linebackers and my safeties. We can be creative with our corners because I trust my defensive line, my linebackers, and my safeties. I can be creative with the safeties because I trust my corners and my, you know what I mean? Every time you do something creative with one group, you're kind of making them weak and you got to lean on the other position groups around them to be able to pick up the slack. And if you trust them to do that, you can do that. Play action rollout. Love connects with Dobbs downfield. Defense bit hard on the play action. Jordan Love with his longest completion of camp, and it was to Romeo Dobbs. Dobbs had a couple steps on him, but had to wait for it a bit. That play was against Sean Davis. Uh, A lot of run plays early. Defense doing a good job of filling the gaps. And Agbar double teamed and washed out of his gap on a run. By the way, what I've learned about an Agbar, and there's going to be, I think, some other... um, notes on him today. I, I I think the biggest thing is he's a he's a massive liability against the run, but I think he could be a really disruptive pass rusher. So this is what I said early on when we drafted him is that he may just end up being a situational pass rusher. All right. Third and fifteen. Well I know they're not running. That's that's kind of how I view this, which is fine to me. Uh, fumbled snap exchange between Aaron Rodgers and Josh Myers. Rodgers had some things to say. The quarterback wasn't pleased. Um, I believe there are two fumbled snap exchanges today. I don't know if both of them were Josh Myers. I'm guessing that they were, but there was also at least one earlier on in camp, which would make three fumbled snap exchanges between Josh Myers and Aaron Rodgers. And uh, considering this is day four and really only kind of day three, of actual training camp stuff, that's really not great. So I don't know how he's doing in terms of his growth as a blocker, uh, his understanding of the offense and all that kind of stuff. I don't know, but he's got to get this under control because this is this is a problem. Dobbs working with the ones, twos, threes doesn't matter. He keeps coming up with catches. A nice catch on a slant from Etling there. Offense has had two fumbles on a snap, uh, failed snap exchange. Rogers wasn't happy with that one. Amos with a near pick of Rodgers. Pressure by Preston forced the throw. Amos quickly out of uh, out to stop a quick pass to Amari. Amos flying around the field today. The entire starting defense is on field goal block unit. That's new. Jack Coco, the first team long snapper once again. Sounds like they're kind of just handing him the job unless he just sucks. So hopefully he doesn't suck. Nice rep by Tippa. He used the quickness of his. Really nice patience and recognition by Zach Tom picking up a stunt up front. Tippa has had some good rushes the first few days, had another one in team just now. Hamilton and Galea getting some reps with the ones. Seems pretty obvious to me that that's, that's three and four, and it seems like it's really not close as far as the pass rushers. You got Rashawn and Preston, and then it will be Hamilton and Tippa for sure. Like, it's, it's really not even close right now. Uh, Wes Hodkowitz says, like what I've seen from Zach Tom at left tackle today, he looks stout, balanced against Green Bay's ones, which is pretty, pretty solid for a mid-round selection to go up against the number one pass rushers in Green Bay and be able to hold your own. Number one defense, very sticky in coverage so far today. Not much for Rodgers to find downfield. Romeo Dobbs with the first reps at punt return. Coach is right. You can feel a different intensity on teams. Players look much more uh, 
almost excited when teams portion starts, talking about special teams. Romeo Dobbs back returning punts, averaged over 12 yards per return at Nevada. Cobb, Amari Rogers, Dobbs, and Hyman getting reps at punt return. Pat O'Donnell hitting bombs today. Bisaccia was just dot, 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 vocal about Rogers calling for a fair catch. And Andy Herman, if you caught it, actually tweeted what he said until somebody kind of made a comment that you're not supposed to do that, and he deleted it. But it was essentially, I don't want to see any fair catches out there. And then apparently he did it again, like right after that or something. I don't know. Right after Bisaccia said that, Herman quote tweeted that and said, and the very next play is a fair catch. Again, Pat O'Donnell is booming some punts. Dallin Leavitt working as a personal protector. Again, the fourth-year safety played a whopping 73% of the Raiders' special team snaps last year. That guy is, if he's not already safety number three, he is right there. Uh, Love with some zip on an out route to Toure. Short gain, but nice read and throw. Last year, Matt LaFleur mentioned wanting to see Love, quote-unquote, rip it. Definitely saw that on that pass to Toure. Offense has been a bit sloppy today. Couple fumbles and false starts. Tyler Davis very much holding his own as a blocker, which is good to see because I haven't, like I said, I haven't seen a ton of great notes from Tyler Davis so far. So if he can block, that's that's great. Gafford with a nice pass breakup on pass attempt from Love to Hyman. A couple nice completions from Love to Toure in move the ball. Two period ends with a Gafford pass deflection. So it sounds like, unfortunately, as has been the case, uh, they move the ball down the field and then kind of comes up flat with a defensive, you know, play. The the reason I phrase it that way is because that's what worries me about Jordan Love. Seems like that happens all the time. He looks great all the way down the field, and then it just kind of collapses. Paul Brettel says, just another practice with no passes going Jair's direction. And I I really don't think in the four days I've seen one note about a, a pass even going toward Jair. I'm probably wrong about that. I don't recall one. Goes on to say several opportunities for Jones to line up out wide today. It's crazy how much stuff they're throwing out there. A lot of really different looks. Play action rollout for Rodgers. Preston did an excellent job of staying home. Would have been a sack. Defense looks fantastic today. Pressure, run stuffing, sticky coverage, showcasing the full potential today. An ag bar with a rep with the ones. Great pressure by Preston and a wounded duck ball falls mercilessly incomplete before Amos could get to it mercifully incomplete. Offense finally gets something going with a Texas route from Rodgers to Dillon. Got the rookie Walker on that one. I don't know what that means, but Packers secondary looking strong. Not much downfield for Rodgers, and first and second reads are often covered. Rashawn Gary is an absolute monster. No additional info needed, just flat out stud. Next note says Rashawn Gary has spent has spent of camp in Rodgers' face. He's off to a great start. Some impressive bursts today from Tyler Goodson with the ball in his hands. Um, In my training camp revision based on training camp four, my roster revision based on training camp four, I did bump Tyler Goodson up above B.J. Baylor just because I've started to see a regular note about Goodson kind of showing up. So another thing to kind of keep an eye on. Starting to get used to Etling to Hyman connection, unstoppable on that slant. Score another one for the chumps today. Rodgers having little time in the pocket during move the ball period. Rashawn Gary and Preston Smith blowing up plays in the backfield. Defense just showed a pre-snap look during move the ball that featured every single defender within 10 yards of the line of scrimmage on third and three. Absolutely no one deep. Rodgers tries to go deep to DeGuara, but it falls incomplete. That's some aggressive stuff from Barry. And that that is kind of cool. If you think about it, I, I can't imagine having the guts on a third and three with a guy like Aaron Rodgers that could easily call something at the line of scrimmage, make some kind of an easy adjustment to put everybody at the line and say best of luck. It feels like one of those things that you would pull on maybe a less experienced quarterback. You do not do it to Aaron Rodgers. And maybe it's just because they know they don't have the speed advantage. I mean, Barry knows he does have the speed advantage, so you're not going to get behind us. It's actually really, really smart if you think about it, because you're, you're going to bring pressure. And Rodgers knows pressure's coming, but he doesn't know from where. And even by the time he figures it out, he's got a split second to make a decision. And again, he's not going to get anybody behind this defense. So the best he can do is find that 50-50 matchup with his favorite guy. It could be like Lazard on Stokes or whatever. Lazard isn't going to get behind him, but maybe if he launches a good ball real fast, he'll be able to make that completion. But that's the best you can do. And you also have to worry about the safeties being able to get there. There's no real short routes that make any sense. I mean, you only need three yards, but still, it's very crowded. But it's just it just doesn't feel like a Packers thing. Not just Joe Barry, but Mike Pettin and 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 
Dom Capers. Like it just, it's not something, it's something that you see in the NFL for sure. It's something you see happen against the Packers. It's not something I'm familiar seeing the Packers doing. And the fact that they did it against Aaron Rodgers and were successful, that's pretty cool. Usually third and three, you get all conservative. You don't know if it's going to be a run or a pass. So you got to protect for both. And you kind of just wait and see. You wait to see if it's a run and it's probably like a play action. And then when it's not, then you, you get your pass rushers on a ho- on their horse and man, you just hope the coverage can hold up before Rashawn or somebody can get there, and you hope that they can get there so we can make something happen. And in that time, you hope the quarterback doesn't take off because it's only three yards. And gee golly willikers, I hope everything kind of holds up here. And you kind of hold your breath for about eight seconds, waiting for this play to unfurl. And at the end, he either finds somebody to throw it to or he doesn't, and that's, that's the play. But to take things in your own hand and say, no, we're coming up on the line of scrimmage, we're coming after you, and there's nothing you can do about it, I love that bravado. And again, it worked. It's not just bravado for the sake of bravado. So I don't know. That gets me kind of excited to be to be that. I mean, it's one thing to call yourself an aggressive defense, but that's what an aggressive defense is. You know, being aggressive in terms of like we, you know, we have good pass rushers or whatever else you want to call that. We'll occasionally send a corner or something if it's like a third and long. Will be kind of risky, but this kind of stuff, I I just love it. And yeah, you're going to get bit once in a while, but whatever. There's going to be another third down. We'll live to fight another day. Note for KB and Ento says, really nice job sticking with the play and breaking up a pass along the sideline. Etling throws up one that should have been picked by Leave It, but Osiris Mitchell plows right through him for a would-be offensive pass interference. KB and Ento with an impressive pass breakup on the left sideline versus Osiris Mitchell on the deep, uh, deep out from Danny Etling. Ento has always shown a knack for playing the football, just hasn't been able to stay healthy. Some of these are the same play, I just I like the additional context. Rico Gafford has been showing up today. That's his third forced incompletion in coverage. Meanwhile, a nice pass rush from Devontae Wyatt. Yeah, buddy. (laughs) Yes, sir. Tough to tell if the run would be blown dead or not, but Dylan just broke a nice run up the field. Looked like he thought he would have been gone. Working in two-minute drill right now. Another false start by the offense. Looked like Winfrey this time. Winfrey getting his opportunities with the ones. I have Rico Gafford down for three really nice coverage reps at cornerback against Love Hyman, Love Amari and Love Amari. Two pass breakups in there. Speedster Gafford having a good day after recently switching back to cornerback from wide receiver. Offense gets one of the bigger completions of the day. Rodgers to Cobb with Shamar Jean Charles in coverage. Leverett and Shamar getting some reps with the ones on defense in the two-minute drill. Huge pick in the end zone to end two-minute drill covering Cobb on the play. Huge play for him that ended up being ruled incomplete. That would have killed the drive. Unfortunately, because it was deemed incomplete, Rodgers gets another shot at it. Unfortunately or fortunately, Lazard rises up and comes up with a touchdown against Stokes. So through a pass, it was basically picked by Shamar, but he didn't get his second foot in or whatever the case may be. So they get another shot at it, at it and um, hit Lazard for the touchdown. Uh, Devontae Vaughn gets a pass breakup, which is the first time I've heard his name. I had to actually look him up and see, is he a corner or a safety or what, what does he do? And then unfortunately, Romeo Dobbs is human after all, a rare drop from the rookie uh, with tight coverage from Ento, who's had a nice day. Aaron Rodgers on NFL Network said Romeo Dobbs has had a really nice start to camp, getting a lot of attention based on some of the plays he's made. I like the approach. Very understated kid, very humble kid. We all feel really good about Romeo and the start he's off to. So, you know, again, it's they're always very cautious to not just heap massive praise out of nowhere, but um, it's 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 a cautious way of not letting the guy get too big of a head and not not getting ahead of themselves with too much praise without actually knowing if he's going to be a good football player, but still just saying essentially based on everything we've seen, he's solid. Uh, Matt LaFleur afterward doing his press conference was asked about Aaron Jones being on special teams. Um, He did mention that that's more of just a break glass in case of emergency thing, which is kind of to be expected. And I I think I forgot to take the note, but I do recall the um, Burkick, our new kicker, was I think 0 for 2 on field goals. Maybe they did more later. I don't know, but I just saw he was 0 for 2. So Mason Crosby on the sideline just doing a great job of protecting his job putting out the juju or whatever. So again, if you kind of want to see this in a nice, tidy little package in terms of how this all comes together and where the roster stands based on uh, all the information, you can check that out at the Packernet substack, packernet.substack.com. Did make several changes to where people are, um, are ranked or tiered. 
Anyways, if you'd like to support the show directly, you can do so at patreon.com forward slash pack underscore daddy. If you'd like to call in to the uh, Packernet After Dark show, you can do so at 608-501-0718, 608-501-0718. We will take a break. We'll be right back. Hey, U.S. Cellular customers, I've got good news, so don't hit skip forward just yet. I'm talking about their special customer event, Us Days. What's Us Days? It means exclusive offers just for their customers, just to say thanks, like up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. No, I didn't just misread that. That's up to $1,200 off. They must really like you. Us Days at U.S. Cellular. Exclusive offers just for you, just to say thanks. Right now, U.S. Cellular customers get up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. Terms apply. With threats to our nation waiting around every corner, adaptability is more important than ever. When conditions change without notice, quick strategic thinking is crucial. And with obstacles consistently impending, determination is essential in overcoming them. It's this willingness, decisiveness, and resilience that sets Marines apart. With our fighting spirit, we don't just fight battles, we win them. Marines are the constant our nation counts on to fight the unknown. And through adaptable problem solving, we do just that. Learn more at Marines.com. Survivor 46 is here and so is On Fire, the only official Survivor podcast. And we have a twist this season. The winner of Survivor 45, D. Valladares, will be joining us every week. We're going behind the scenes of the biggest moments, the how and the why things happen, and the strategy and analysis you can only get from someone like me. A Survivor winner. Listen to On Fire, the official Survivor podcast, wherever you get your podcast. Introducing Royal Caribbean's newest ship, Icon of the Seas, the ultimate family vacation. The ultimate six slides, eight neighborhoods, zero compromise vacation. The ultimate never done that, can't wait to do it vacation. The ultimate chillin' by a different pool every day of the week vacation. This is the Icon of Vacations. Icon of the Seas, arriving in 2024. Book today. Come seek the Royal Caribbean. Ships Registry Bahamas. Does Monday at the office feel like a storm? Not with Microsoft Copilot. That feeling when Copilot gets everyone up to speed instantly? It's sunny again. When Copilot simplifies complex data so your teams can act, that sun's shining on a beach. And when Copilot uncovers hidden insights, you're on that beach with your people, and you find buried treasure. That's Microsoft Copilot. Learn more at Microsoft.com slash AI for all. So I guess one of the things that kind of gets lost in the shuffle that I want to kind of mention a little bit, you know, we spend a lot of time focusing on sort of the rankings, the 53, how things are going to be sorted out. But at the end of the day, when week one rolls around, who the number four safety is isn't going to matter all that much to us. A lot of the details and stuff, it may come in handy at some point and, and impact special teams and be kind of interesting information, but it kind of gets lost or I guess what's getting lost, at least for me, is just the simple question of how is the confidence level based on what we've seen so far? And again, haven't really seen much in terms of actual football playing with pads and all that stuff, but certainly some things have been better than others. And in the grand scheme of things, come week one, week two, week three, we got to play real football. So I kind of want to just look through it real quick. Number one being the wide receivers. I think overall, I am probably more concerned than less. I'm very excited about Romeo Dobbs. I'm very excited about him. I don't know to what degree he's going to be a great football player. And again, there's a lot to be excited about. The fact that Romeo Dobbs looks good. The fact that Lazard had you know one good first day or whatever. Um, Jawan Winfrey, some cool things have been happening. But that's not who's going to be playing a lot of football for us. And again, Romeo Dobbs, I, I maybe he's going to go out and just be this elite rookie. I don't know. But I don't necessarily think that's going to be the case. And so when we look at it, Sammy Watkins spent the entire day out there apparently, as far as I know, and I didn't hear his name once. Lazard has been quiet since the first practice, basically. He did have the one touchdown, but otherwise he's more or less been shut out by this defense. Randall Cobb has had maybe two catches that I can recall. Amari has done nothing. Ture has been done nothing. Jawan, again, is not going to be playing all that much. And so I, I don't know, and granted, it's a really tough defense, it's a really tough secondary and all that, and I, I do have a general confidence in, in Alan Lazard and whatnot, but I just worry, 
especially with Sammy Watkins and Christian Watson, right? I, I know what Alan Lazard is, and I know what he may become, but it's sort of a question of what else? And yes, Ro- again, Romeo is the wild card here, but with Sammy kind of being quiet, and it's only been one day, granted, but it's sort of, I, I need to know that somebody else is going to be able to do something, and both of those guys have been injured. Sammy hasn't done anything. Watson might not get hardly any practice, if any at all, in this offseason. And so overall, my confidence level in the wide receivers, in a sense, has gone down. Although Romeo has clearly been a, uh, a glimmer of hope. And I, and I think things with Amari are actually quite good, although it's been quiet. There have not been bad reports. There have been a couple of good reports that, you know, very few people have reported on, but apparently he's doing good things. The coaches have said good things. Apparently he's in very good shape right now, and, and the athleticism was kind of an issue. Matt LaFleur had made a comment about Amari Rogers essentially last year, um, we didn't see the level of athleticism that we saw when he was in college. And we need to see that again. And so by getting him to trim up, that's what our expectation is. We want to see that Clemson Amari Rogers, and we didn't see that last year. The The conditioning was not there. And Amari has acknowledged that, that he was not in shape and, and uh, was, was really struggling to keep up with the pace and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, maybe Amari can, can kind of be whatever. But again, the Watson Watkins thing, there has to be something there, and there hasn't been yet. For for good reason, they've been injured. But again, that's my biggest concern. If Watson comes back and emerges, if Watkins comes back and emerges, then you got Lazard, where there's a, a general level of, level of comfort. You have Randall that can do something, and then you have Watkins and or Watson who are giving you something. But then there's also the wild card of of Dobbs and Amari and all that. So that's when it would be kind of becoming a positive. Right now, I think my my overall has gone down a bit. Offensive line, my confidence has gone up quite a bit. I love that there are so many options that the Packers seem to like more. And that that's the thing. If, if primarily we see Yash at left tackle, John running at left guard, Josh Myers at, at center, um, and then, you know, let's say Royce and then Cole Van Lannan or, or some kind of combination of that, maybe uh, somebody else at right guard or whatever. If that's just kind of the constant starting offense, then that kind of sucks. Because essentially what we had last year is as good as it's going to get, with the exception of, I don't know when we're getting Bakhtiari or Jenkins back. But the fact that Zach Tom, for for one, has gotten a massive amount of looks at tackle, they really, it's, it's not only have they, has he been twice, and he's the only one, he and Yash, as far as I know, are the only ones that have played left tackle with the ones. Maybe some of the only ones that have played left tackle hardly at all. Not only that, but when Zach Tom, the two, two, so out of, out of four days, two of those days, he's been running with the ones at left tackle, but he also, when he's with the ones, he runs with the twos. So when they swap out with the twos, they keep Zach Tom at left tackle. They want to see him. They want to get a real good look at him at, at tackle, but they also really want to get him up to speed at tackle. That is really encouraging. Sean Ryan has gotten a lot of opportunities at right guard. Jake Hansen, uh, has gotten a ton of opportunities at guard, in particular right guard. Cole Van Landen, right tackle and right guard, been getting a ton of opportunities there. That j- Just from the start of the season, Cole Van Landen was not even on my radar. Neither was Jake Hansen, by the way. I thought, I thought he was going to end up getting cut because I tried to be excited about him because he's the only other guy that can play center, but they just never gave him opportunities. They never played him. And now you got Matt LaFleur saying he's really taking a step and we like what he can do and we want to see what he can do. Again, Cole Van Lannan right out of the gate getting right tackle snaps. Like, where the heck did this guy come from? So the competition really feels like it's 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 building up. Michael Manette seems like he is the the uh, left guard number two right now. When when you look at the twos, it's always for the most part Manette. So there's there's all these guys that are really promising that are not just promising backups, but are seemingly actually legitimately fighting for. Uh, either starting or prominent roles, right? Zach Tom, I think, is in a competition with Elton, with uh, Yash Neishman. I think he loses that battle because Yash has so much experience, but he is being launched so quickly in that direction. It's kind of shocking to me. He's getting way more opportunities at left tackle than Sean Ryan is at guard. Way more. But Zach Tom, very legitimate. Sean Ryan, very legitimate for a guard spot. Michael Manette, very legitimate. Jake Hansen, legitimate. Cole Van Lannan. These are guys that are really actually competing for jobs. 
And if anybody of those guys that I listed ends up winning, we improved our offensive line. And if nothing else, even if we don't, the depth along our offensive line just keeps getting stronger. And that is so huge for this team. Um, Tight end, I think I'm probably less excited about. Um, Tunyon obviously has been out. I have not heard a single note about anybody. I have not heard about a big play from Mercedes. I have not heard about any growth from Josiah, which is very important. I have not heard a single play from Dominique Daphne. And I understand it's it's t-shirt season, but Dobbs is in a t-shirt and he's making plays. The tight ends are not. And maybe they're mostly staying in blocking and that kind of stuff, but still, I have not heard anything. Tyler Davis, as I mentioned, has not been necessarily as advertised so far. Very few plays as a receiver. Uh, the one that stands out was one that went off his hands and ended up getting picked. So not that I necessarily expected a massive amount, but if nothing else, it would have been nice to to get some Tyler Davis hype and maybe a little bit of growth about Josiah. I don't think I've had a single note about Josiah this entire training camp. Um, quarterbacks, I think I'm more encouraged. Rodgers has just been on point. I mean, not that I expect necessarily anything else, but it's it's all been positive. I've I've really not heard about a single bad throw, bad attitude, bad bad hair day for Aaron Rodgers. And Jordan Love, I think there has been a lot of very encouraging things. I, I don't think there's any been there's ever really been any really bad notes about Jordan Love. A couple of slightly errant passes, you know, a little bit of that was slightly behind kind of thing. But otherwise it's mostly just been um extremely encouraging. I mean, not just again with accurate passes, but the specifics about Jordan Love in terms of we've been waiting to see this and now we're seeing it. Uh, the the biggest thing is zip on his passes, but you know, good reads and and throwing across his body and the zip on the passes and um I don't I think he's got a pick, pick or two, I'm not entirely sure, but I haven't seen anything about egregious anything about Jordan Love so far. Again, doesn't mean a ton, but am I more or less encouraged? I am more encouraged. Um, running backs, I, it's silly to say less encouraged because I know Aaron Jones and AJ Dillon are the only guys that matter and they're really, really good. But, um, I just haven't heard anything, you know, I mean, it's just same thing with when the offense does, it's, it's almost entirely Romeo Dobbs. Anybody else on offense has been a disappointment. All the other wide receivers, tight ends, running backs, they're all a disappointment if their name isn't Romeo Dobbs or, uh, Juwan and Lazard on day one. Otherwise disappointed. Again, not worried, but there hasn't been a, a lot of great developments there. Tyler Goodson has had a couple good notes. BJ Baylor's had maybe one, one or two, but um, you know, nothing about Patrick Taylor, nothing about uh, special teams usage for these guys necessarily. Um, Kylan Hill is still on pup. I know he was a kick returner, which was probably his saving grace prior to all this. And with that job probably being stolen away from him, which is a good thing because we can certainly do better than Kylan Hill then I don't know how strong his hold is on that job. Again, who cares? Number three running back spot. But it would be, it'd be nice to get a little bit more, you know, the same way we hear about Rashawn Gary being dominant. It would be nice to hear A.J. Dillon or Aaron Jones just, you can't stop them. They're unstoppable. They're doing that, 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 that. You know, the one note today about A.J. Dillon getting a big, a big carry. I'd like to see more of that. I haven't seen anything about Aaron Jones other than he lines up at, in the slot or, you know, he caught a pass that one time or something. And maybe it's just because it's ho-hum and people don't tweet about it. I'm not saying they've been bad. I'm just saying it, it, it would be nice to hear that our, our dominant running back duo are really hard to contain. So again, am I lower on them? No, because I mean, if I have to, I'll say yes. But I, I, the, the needle has not moved at all for me in terms of how I think our running backs are going to perform in 2022 based on what I've seen in training camp. Um, defensive side of things, I think I'm a little less optimistic about the defensive line, but it's it's very marginal. And the only reason I'm even saying that is just because I haven't seen anything from Devontae Wyatt. I know what we have in Kenny, although it, it may be getting better with him getting trimmed up and all that kind of stuff. Maybe that'll add a little dynamic. Dean Lowry has been kind of on point, but again, I've always really liked Dean Lowry anyways. I think he's underrated. I haven't really heard much about Jerron. I think I've seen like one good note from him, so I don't really expect a ton in terms of greatness. Uh, Devontae was the one kind of wild card that I really thought was going to be out there early and often. The last two days, we're starting to see it, right? The, the first two days, I didn't hear his name once. Yesterday was the first time, I, or I guess two days ago, first time I heard anything at all. And then this past training camp day four was the first time or the second time. And, and again, more Devontae Wyatt notes. So as those grow, I get more excited about the defensive line. But as of right now, it's just Reed, Kenny, and Lowry, which is what I thought it was to begin with, with a little bit of Slayton mixed in. But um, even at that, not a ton of dominant 
you know, sack by Kenny, sack by Jerron, sack by Lowry or Wyatt or Slayton or Heflin or anybody. I don't know if I've seen a single sack by a defensive tackle this entire, you know, they're, they're fake sacks. I get all that. I'm just saying. I, I, I've, I've seen it from Preston. I've seen it from Rashawn. I've seen it from, uh, you know, Hamilton. Just would like to see it like ones from Kenny or something. So um, I, I guess you would say it's about the same, but I was hoping it would be better. So maybe I'm, I'm a little bit lower on the defensive tackle group than I hoped I would be at this point. Um, pass rushers, I would say I'm almost a little bit more excited. My, my, the way I looked at it before is we got Rashawn, we got Preston and there's nobody, right? I mean, the, the fact that I thought it was going to be Garvin and Ramsey and maybe Kingsley would kind of be able to push his way into that. And again, the fact that we just drafted Kingsley, we have Ramsey and Garvin who we had before and the Packers are like, no dude, Tippa and Hamilton are where it's at. Like, you know, we have Ramsey and Garvin still on the team and they're, they're decent. Like, no, 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 this is better. And then we also have Garvin, and we also have Ramsey, and we also have Kingsley. It just gives me a, a feeling of, okay, so I guess we have six-ish, seven, if, if you know Kingsley can kind of do stuff once in a while. That's pretty cool. I mean, we'll probably end up cutting uh, one or two or whatever, but still, it, it just it, it, it's always good when guys get replaced because it means that we upgraded. That's it. Garvin was the guy. There's two guys ahead of him now. Ramsey was the guy. There's two guys ahead of him now. Both of these guys leapfrog from third team to second team. That's important information, and it, it, it gets me excited. And, and beyond that, Preston has looked pretty good. Not a ton of notes, but I haven't seen anything negative, and I've seen a handful of positive. And as for Rashawn, it's exactly what you want to see from a guy that you're really... Rashawn Gary and Jair Alexander are the two guys you put big circles around and say, these are your stars. Please tell me they're not going to regress. Please, please, please. All right? You can say Kenny is, but eh. Those two are the superstars. And you want to hear that they're better than everybody. And that's all I've heard. Jair has not been looked at once. Rashawn cannot be stopped. Those are superstars. And they've been acting like superstars. And that gets me excited. So I'm higher than our, on our edges than I was a little while ago when I thought it was Rashawn and maybe nobody. Because I don't know what to expect from Preston. Now it's maybe a little bit like Rashawn and then a big drop off. But it's still you feel like there's maybe a pile of guys that can get the job done. Inside linebacker, again, I'm kind of excited um, for similar reasons. I, I, I just love the competition at, at some, of these, some of these positions. First of all, Quay, I, I've not seen anything super positive, but I've heard nothing negative either. I, I've seen a couple positive notes, but it sounds like Devondre and Quay are just kind of operating quite well. The defense is doing well, and they're a part of that. You know, not hearing anything from Aaron Jones, A.J. Dillon, that has something to do with the linebacker. Obviously, there's no live tackling or anything, but whatever. The other exciting thing, though, is Ray Wilborn, who apparently was running with the ones, not only maybe j- leapfrog Ty Summers and Isaiah McDuffie, but may have possibly leapfrog Chris Barnes. So again, somebody else to kind of keep an eye on, a uh, smaller linebacker, good coverage linebacker, special teamer possibly, you know, just gets me really excited about the, the potential of finding these little diamonds in the rough that are able to kind of just bolster the, the, the totality of this roster. Um, cornerback, I don't know. I think, the again, Jair is the most important thing. If he can stay elite, I really don't care about anything else. I don't think anything else could get bad enough that we would just be in serious trouble. If Eric Stokes doesn't grow at all and Razul regresses a little bit, again, goes from five picks down to one or two, but Jair is still like elite, elite Jair, I'll take that. Because it's just so stupid valuable to have a guy that just erases number one wide receivers. There's almost nothing more valuable than that. You got quarterbacks and then, I don't know, maybe that. So yeah, there's been a couple notes about Stokes getting beat. And I think as, um, I forget who it was, I think it was Nagler was was pointing out, because somebody said it on Twitter, you know, why do I keep seeing notes about him getting beat? But, you know, it's like I said about multiple snaps. You know, it's cool if you get two sacks, but that's out of what, 40, 50 plays. So in the grand scheme of things, it's not that. So yeah, there was that touchdown and it was against Stokes. And it's like, oh, here we go again. Stokes got beat and it was for a touchdown. And, and, and. Yeah, but you haven't heard Stokes' name in like three days. So take that into account. So I'm still excited about Stokes. I'm very excited about Jair. Uh, Razul, I think, ended up getting another pick, which is cool because that's, you know, again, I don't expect him to maintain that level of play, but if he's able to still just be a real sticky, uh, you know, cover guy that can that can not only play well but also has a, a nose for the ball that's pretty exciting stuff and then as far as depth you know I don't know if I'm necessarily more or less excited about the depth it, it's it's going to be a problem either way 
But um, I'm about, I'm more optimistic, again, because of Jair. So far, we'll see. Maybe Jair does take a step back, but but um, he's doing what you would expect a superstar to do. I don't know how else to say it. Um, at safety, I, I guess I'll say more excited. I haven't heard any really big news about Adrian and Savage. I wish I was hearing a little bit more, but again, the defense has mostly been pretty locked down. I have not heard about a single reception against Darnell Savage, so we can talk about how I haven't seen any Darnell Savage picks, but I also have not heard one note about Savage getting beat. In fact, let me look, because I've got all my notes here. Let's see if I have one Savage note. Uh, nothing today. I have nothing from day three. Day two, do, 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 scroll down to safety here. Amos, here's a savage note. What does it say? Big time collision between Dobbs. Oh, Dobbs and Safe and, and Savage. And that was when Dobbs held on. So it was it was a freakish play where Dobbs caught it because Savage just came across the field and smoked the guy. And nothing on day one. So one completion by Romeo Dobbs uh, is the only note I have. Day one against Amos was a big play by Lazard against Amos. Uh, day two was a pick by Amos when it was off the hands of uh, so it was behind Romeo Dobbs tipped and Amos Amos picked it. Day three, I got nothing. And then uh, this past day, Amos quickly out to stop a quick pass to Amari and then Amos near pick a Roger. So Amos has been all over the place. Savage hasn't done too much aside from killing Dobbs and, and not giving up a single reception. So I'm, I'm not mad about it. Again, especially since the defense, is, the, the coverage defense in particular, but the defense in general has been real, real stiff. Aside from day one, it's been like the defense has been winning the day. Um, and then as far as depth, I'm probably a little bit more excited, um, especially Dallin Leavitt. I mean, he was, he was just a special teams guy, but he's just launching himself up through the ranks to, I mean, he may be number three today. I don't know, but, uh, he, that, that gets me excited that we've got that guy coming in for competition and seems to be doing a really good job. Again, not just as a special teamer, but as a legitimate real, um, safety Special teams, I, I don't think I could be any more excited about it. Um, the kicking thing is is rough, but, you know, Mason's the guy, Mason's the guy. And, and, and I like the combo with Mason and Pat O'Donnell. We got the note this past day about Pat o O'Donnell kicking bombs. I don't think he's the greatest punter in the world, but I'll take it, you know. Last thing I want to hear is about shanked punts, and I didn't hear any. So I think that's a pretty good kicking duo. The fact that Jack Coco seems to be winning the job over Steve Wartell is great news. Have not heard a single issue with that. Hearing real great things about the intensity, not only from the coaches, but from the players, the different feel, the different exi- excitement, the different, uh, you know, intensity that they play with, but also the the returners. You know, I feel like we've got a real, you know, the fact that Amari is number two on all of these and that there's other options. Romeo Dobbs is the the new number one punt returner right now. I think it's Ento is the number one uh, kick returner, and there's a bunch of other guys trying for it right now. we got Randall Cobb back on punts again. I'm not saying that's a good thing, but it's you know it's a thing that we've done in the past. And then just a ton of kick returners: um, Rico Gafford, Romeo Dobbs, Amari Rogers, Danny Davis, Aaron Jones. And and again, I, I wouldn't be surprised if Christian Watson is a consideration at some point, depending on his contributions on the offense. I mean, if if um, if it does end up being the Sammy Watkins show and we don't see a ton of Christian Watson, it may be one of those things similar to Amari, where he gets a little bit of time on offense and a little bit of time as a kick returner as well. But I think overall, my optimism is, has gone up quite a bit, um, especially since we're, we're just getting started. And there's already some really positive developments coming. And of all the negative ones, plenty of opportunity for growth. The defensive line, again, Devontae Wyatt, if he continues to grow, we're right on track. Wide receivers, we, we just need some opportunities to either establish completely that Dobbs is legitimately like a number two or for Watkins and or Watson to start playing and, and get some good news there. But overall, I think things have been great. Guys are starting to come back. And um, yeah, it, it really couldn't be too much better. I love the competitions that are going on. A lot of positive developments. A lot of guys winning jobs that are shocking to me and doing it quickly. And so I'm excited. The, the thing I love about this team is we're building for the future. We can talk about win now all we want, but this is a team that always has and always will build for the future. And there's so much young talent here. I don't know exactly what Dobbs and, and Watson will be or Amari Rogers, but that is the future. Samore Ture. Danny Davis. I don't know what they're going to be, but these are young, talented players. Zach Tom, Sean Ryan, John Runyon, Josh Myers, Royce Newman, Elton Jenkins, Jake Hansen, the entire offensive line, with the exception of David Bakhtiari, all really young talent, really young. Runyon, Myers, Newman, 
Sean Ryan, Zach Tom, all the last three draft classes. John, uh, Elton Jenkins, Jake Hansen. And that doesn't even include Rasheed Walker, George Moore, Cole Schneider, Ty Cleary, the rest of the offense. Cole Van Lannan, 2021 sixth round pick. Caleb Jones. Everybody, for the most part, is brand spanking new. Uh, the tight ends, Dominique Daphne, Josiah DeGuara, Robert Tunyon. These are young football players, for the most part. You know, Jordan Love, I don't know what he is, but there you go. That's the future right now. A.J. Dillon, young. Kylan Hill, Patrick Taylor, Tyler Goodson, B.J. B. All young. Even Aaron Jones is not old, but it's, it's not as though the foundation is a bunch of old guys and then we're just doomed. You know, there's so many teams. You look beyond the veterans that are talented and there's just scraps. That's not the Packers. They've got a good core foundation and they're building a foundation under their foundation. So when the foundation starts to crumble, guess what? We got a new one already set underneath it. You know, we got Kenny, we got Jerome, we got Dean Lowry. We got kind of the old school guys, although Kenny's still probably 15 years old. But we also got TJ Slayton and we also got Devontae Wyatt. You know, number one pass rusher is a, is a guy still on his rookie contract. And we drafted Kingsley. Yeah, Devondre's getting maybe a little bit up in age. We drafted Quay to be Devondre. So whenever it stops working with Devondre, we got a new Devondre who's young. We got Savage and Carpenter and Leave It and all these guys. I don't know how old Leave It is actually, but the, the, the corners, Jair and Stokes, they're young guys. Everybody on this team is young with the exception of our punter and our kicker <laughs> and our starting quarterback. And even that, they're still continually trying to... And that's, that's the whole thing with Aaron, Jordan Love. Everyone gets so mad for stupid reasons. You know what? That's what the Packers do. They set it up so that when, when the, the thing on top breaks away, we've got a contingency plan underneath it. And Jordan Love is that contingency plan. And if we didn't have Jordan Love, we wouldn't have any plan whatsoever. Maybe it's not going to work. So what? Maybe it's not going to work with Devontae Wyatt. Should we not have drafted him? Because, hey, we got Kenny. What a stupid pick. That's not how that works, man. And that's not how that should work. So, yeah, I'm just, I'm very excited about this, this team. And, and, you know, I know that there's stars here and I, I, I don't know who that's going to be. I don't know if it's Quay Walker. I don't know if it's Zach Tom. I don't know if it's Romeo Dobbs or Christian Watson. I don't know if it's, it's, uh, you know, Devonte Wyatt or Ellis Brooks. I have no idea, but I know somewhere in here are some players that, um, from this group that are going to be really, really talented. Even, even guys from maybe a year ago, like, uh, Josh Myers or Jake Hansen or Cole Van Lannan or whatever, some of these guys are going to start to emerge and, and become something that we didn't expect, that we didn't see coming. And I'm, I'm just very, very excited to see that materialize. Yeah, there's going to be misses, obviously, but I'm, I'm excited to find out who these guys are that are going to emerge. So anyways, you guys have yourselves a fantastic day. I will talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one. Bye-bye. <laughs>